So I was born in 1955, and um, as a young child, uh, Playboy magazine had just come out, and my dad always said that he bought them for the articles. And when I was two years old, I had a purple crayon, and the magazine was sitting on the coffee table, and I thought, these ladies are cold, they need some clothes. So I drew clothes all over them with the purple crayon. <laughs> and then all of a sudden the magazine started to disappear. <laughs> and even though he said he bought them for the articles, I think it might have been something else. But <laughs> then he bought me this little kit and it was called How to Draw or Learn to Draw by John Nagy, <laughs> who was a syndicated um, TV artist in the 50s. And we had a black and white TV, and every Sunday, I believe, there was his program. And it was an hour-long show, and it was, he would teach you how to learn, you know, how to draw. Mm -hmm. And so I watched it religiously as this little kid. And then Margaret Keene was very popular as, as an artist, and she's the one that did the, the big-eyed kids. And so because she was my only real influence, I used to draw um, people and I always wanted to draw people because um, I had this kind of a strained relationship with my mother and she always worked outside the home and so I was left home alone a lot even as a small child that small she was an Avon lady and she would leave me and so I guess I was always trying to connect with people and so I, I could because I think seeing faces is the first form of communication as a child, and so I was always drawn to faces, and so naturally I just wanted to draw faces. And the big-eyed kids were popular at the time, so I drew people that looked like that, I drew ballet dancers, and I drew horses when I was a little kid. And then going to elementary school, all the teachers wanted me to do the bulletin boards, and all the little girls wanted me to do paper dolls for them. So I would draw the paper dolls, but I would tell them, you have to color in the clothes yourself. I won't do that. <laughs> and so I constantly did that. And then in high school, I got a C in art, and it just about devastated me. My high school art teacher never, um, I guess she just didn't like what I did. And her name was Zanaid Lure, and this was Central High School in Omaha, Nebraska. And her favorite color was orange, so to this day I don't like orange, even though I'll use it in my paintings. Huh. Orange really affects me. But um, then um, I, was, uh, I got a scholarship to go to college at Washington University, and I was a fashion design major because I didn't think I could do art, and I tried to do something where, I mean, I guess this goes back to the paper doll days, but, you know, I was always designing clothes. And so um, I went to college the first year and I had all the core classes that you need. So it was economics and English and math and um, nothing really that related to art. And I got very frustrated and I quit school and I hitchhiked out to San Francisco and met a lady on the streets, a Buddhist lady who made puka shell ne ne necklaces. And she said, oh, you really should be a street artist and you can draw portraits on the streets. And so that resonated with me and I got my $50 street artist license and mm -hmm. I would go down to Fisherman's Wharf every day and try to draw portraits. And sadly, they all looked like big-eyed kids because I had no art education. <laughs> and then one day a woman um, came up to me and she said, I'm an artist in New Orleans. You need to let me draw your portrait. So I sat for her, and she did the most beautiful portrait of me. And she said, if you really want to learn to draw, you should move to New Orleans and be a street artist there. So within two weeks, I was packed up and on my way to New Orleans, and this is in the 70s. And um, I did learn a lot. My work got a lot better. I was a street artist at Jackson Square. And then I traveled up the East Coast and did portraits on the, on the streets. And this was all in pastel and charcoal. And then in the mid-70s, I had a car accident, so I went back to Omaha, Nebraska, and um, I landed back at my mother's door, and she said, well, you can't stay here. So I figured I gotta do something to make a living, and I tried to do portraits on the streets in Omaha, Nebraska, which that was unheard of then and there. 
But there was this woman, and usually how I would get started is that um, people would come up and um, sit for me, and I called it a shill, but they would give me maybe a half an hour to 45 minutes of their time, and they would sit, and I would usually either give them the portrait or sell it for $5 or whatever, and then that would get the whole thing started, so then usually people would ask me to have their portraits done because they could see one being done. But this woman had a China doll haircut and red hair and a kimono on, and I thought she was so interesting, and I asked her if she would sit. And she said, oh, well, I have a one o'clock haircut, but let me give you my phone number, and y I'll trade you a haircut for a portrait. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So I connected with her, and I went to her apartment, and I did two pastel portraits of her, and she said, you know, you really should go to beauty school because you're so talented. You'd be a great hairdresser. And of course, the next day, I signed up for beauty school. And so I did hair for over 40 years and never did another piece of art after that until I was in my 50s. And then I decided to go back to college. So here I was a hairdresser and a realtor and an auctioneer. The, these were the careers I had at that age. And I went back to college for um, historic preservation. And my final project was to create a diptych, two pieces that would be part of a room um, that I was designing for this class, um, a period room. And so I did these two paintings that kind of look like Maxfield Parrish's work. And I hadn't painted in over 40 years, but I was just using three primary colors and black, just like Maxfield Parrish in his printing process. And my instructor came over to me and he said, you're a hairdresser? And I said, yes. And he said, and you're a realtor? And I said, yes. And he said, and you're an auctioneer? And I said, yes. And he said, you've missed your calling. And he walked away. And I thought, well, I'm still alive, you know, I'm not dead yet. So that was kind of the catalyst that brought me to thinking about being an artist. And then when I met my husband, which um, th he's my second husband, and um, we've been married 12 years, and when I first met him, I asked, and it was about the same period of time, and I asked him if he would sit for a portrait, because I hadn't honestly done anything except that painting for that class. And so he sat for 45 minutes, and I got out my, pa or my charcoals, and I drew him, and when he got up from sitting and looked at it, he got tears in his eyes, and he said, really, that's what you should be doing. So when I turned 60, um, I pretty much quit all of my careers and focused on my art. And so it's been seven, almost eight years now that I've been pretty much full-time doing something in the arts. My exhibit is called Unity with Variety, and I've been teaching a, um, a enrichment class at Purdue Fort Wayne, and I'm, I teach the elements of painting. And one of the most important elements is composition. And they stress that the painting to be interesting and unified has to have a good composition. And so um, being unified um, is important, but you need to have some variety so it doesn't become boring. And so that's kind of how I, how I started getting this idea. But also being a newcomer in Fort Wayne, I've been here almost two years now, and before I moved here, I did a lot of research about Fort Wayne. And one of the things I looked at was the demographics, and I found that there was a large Caucasian population, German, Caucasian, Burmese, African American, and then it said other. And so I thought, well, what is this other? And so that was kind of what started me to think, maybe I should explore who these others are. And I just didn't know how to really go about it. And then I decided that I wanted to have an exhibit here, and I was lucky enough to be one of the featured artists in October. And I just thought, well, you know, I love painting portraits. I need to have a series of works, and maybe I'll explore the idea of these others and do portraits of all the the cross population that lives here in Fort Wayne. But how am I gonna find these people? I'm new in the community.
So the first thing I did was um, I explored an idea on Google that was uh, a diversity breakfast that they were having, and it was sponsored by Amani. And so I went to the breakfast, even though the website said that it was full, I thought I'm just gonna show up anyway because maybe I can make some contacts. And so there was a table that wasn't occupied and a woman named Raquel Klein, who works with the Multicultural Council and English as a Second Language, she said, well, we have um, space at our table. You're welcome to join us. So I sat at their, their table and it was such an enriching experience. I listened to a lot of these people who came here from other countries that are business owners now and they've done remarkable things in the community and they were some of the award winners and so after the breakfast was over I thought well I'm going to reach out to some of these organizations and I tried to network but it was pretty difficult. Um, I did get some business cards and that was October of last year so I thought welcoming week because Mayor Henry was there and he said um, that he was declaring October 22nd as welcoming day. So I just assumed that that was welcoming day. And then I decided to have my exhibit in October thinking that it would be in, um, it would coincide with welcoming week. And then Amani told me after the fact that no, it's in September. So I pushed my exhibit up to October 1st and that's the reception of it so that I could at least be closer because Welcoming Week is actually the 8th through the 19th, I believe, of September. And so then I had to find all these people and I reached out to all these groups and most people were too busy, they didn't have time, they weren't interested. And then all of a sudden, finally in February, just a few months back in February, um, Raquel said, well, let me put something on my website if you, if you write something up. And so I wrote up a little blurb about trying to find people for my project. And then she put it on her website and people started to respond. And so that's kind of how it started. And then what I would do is I would book a Zoom meeting with everyone just to kind of find out what their stories were because I didn't want it just to be a face. I wanted it to be um, their story and I wanted to collaborate with each person to find out what was important to them and in my mind it was wearing your traditional clothing um, because my background is actually Russian and being born in the 50s and being raised pretty much by my grandparents um, they came from Russia which actually they were from Ukraine um, which is they were from Kiev which is Ukraine now, but it was Russia at the time, and it was during the Cold War, and so just like today, Russia didn't have a very good relationship with the U.S., and so my grandparents basically didn't talk about being Russian or their Russian heritage, so I always felt like there was something that I was longing to know about my, my family, you know, the, the, the roots of my family, and so this was important for me that I feel that people need to keep their culture alive and then just bring it to our culture and enrich our culture with their culture rather than becoming homogeneous and blending in with everything that's here. And I just think living in bigger cities, you know, that it, the city is more vibrant with all this interesting, you know, additional melting pot of people. The, the cultures that come here are so important and I feel that they need to be celebrated. And I think people would understand the, the differences much better um, if they, or try to understand them much better if they were aware of them and that they're people just like anyone else. Just because their skin is a different color or their clothing looks different or they talk a little bit different, you know, they're still wonderful people and, you know, I think it would maybe this little bit that I'm doing will help people understand each other better. So this project is all about communicating the differences of cultures. Um, none of my subjects get to see their paintings until the reception. And so I've kept everything kind of hidden, which is um, exciting because they'll all be coming or as many as can come to the reception wearing the same clothing 
So the idea is that they're standing in front of their painting, the paintings will be draped, the drape will be dropped and they'll get to see their paintings with the crowd at the same time, dressed in the same clothing, maybe sort of like a live mannequin. I'm sort of theatrical, but I like that whole concept. And so it should be really pretty moving, I think. And then there's also an audio component that I'm adding to the show. Um, and if I can work this out, I'm trying to do an augmented reality where um, it's not just the painting that we're looking at, but we'll have a QR code that we scan. And then the library is graciously giving out some earbuds to people that they can listen to three questions that I've been recording with each person about how they came to Fort Wayne, how they like it here, what was the hardest thing to adjust to, what do they miss the most about their country, and then what's the most important thing they'd like to share. And I've asked each one of them to um, answer three of the five questions and try to keep it under a minute for each person. But that should add some interest to the show. And when I look back at some of these videos, it just really moves me. So I hope the, anybody that attends it will be moved as much as I have been creating this work. <laughs>